the army was taking around this defector from Polish version of Spetsnaz, and he was lecturing us on his experiences in being in the the Polish uh, special forces. And one of the topics was, is, you know, how they would approach a, a nuclear missile. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Just down this road, the South Vietnamese forces regroup once again, and we're trying to fight off the advancing North Vietnamese. On back light. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. Griffin, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic. Phil Logan served in the U.S. Army from 1986 to 1991. He went through infantry school at Fort Benning, Georgia, was sent to Germany and assigned to the Ground Defense Force for the Pershing II tactical nuclear missile. He describes in some detail the defense tactics, including against special forces, the Red Army faction, and anti-nuclear demonstrations. Phil was also there when the INF Disarmament Treaty was signed and recalls the Soviet inspectors visiting after that treaty was signed. Now, many of our fans are the proud owners of a Cold War Conversations coaster, a gift from me to thank them for helping the podcast financially. So, how do you join this select band? Well, for the price of a couple of coffees a month to cover the show's increasing costs and keep us on the air, you can get a coaster too. Just head over to patreon.com slash coldwarpod. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash coldwarpod. So, back to today's episode. I'm delighted to welcome Phil Logan to Cold War Conversations. So, Phil, can you tell me a little bit about your background and why you joined the U.S. Army? Sure. Uh, back when, I think as I told you before we started recording, I was always interested in the military. And when I joined up, I was 22, and I had been working as an electrician at a construction site. And anyways, I was working on one where I just came out sweaty, covered in dirt. It was nasty. And I'd been working down in a dark hole. And I finally said to myself, I got to do something better. And so I decided to join the army. And the main reason was, as I mentioned, I was into military history and I didn't want to go and be like, you know, an old man one day and always wondering what it would have been like. So those two things primarily are what pushed me into joining the army. And that was in November 1986 at Alexandria, Virginia. Okay. And uh, which which particular unit of the Army did you join? Well, after uh, infantry school at Fort Benning, I was uh, already had been assigned to go to Germany, but they didn't tell me what unit I was going to. So in February 87, after graduation, I was put on a plane and sent to Frankfurt, Germany. And there at the time, they had various stations where uh, uh, incoming soldiers would be processed and they would be sent to these, like, uh, I don't know, for lack of a better word, like offices or workstations where the unit they were going to be assigned to. And I remember getting there and I was told I had to go over to this certain one state workstation. I was being assigned to a Pershing two missile command. And I, you know, and I'd been infantry, Fort Benning is the school of the infantry back then, and it still is. And anyways, you know, what is a guy in the infantry going to do in a Pershing missile unit? Well, anyways, I go there, and there's a a sergeant in there who was from the Philippines. And uh, behind him on the wall was this huge uh, circular picture of a missile with two lightning bolts on either side. 
And above it was a tab that said Pershing on it. And sure enough, I was getting assigned to a Pershing missile unit. Right. That- why, I, I, why I don't know, I couldn't tell you. But to make a long story short, is the ground defense force for the Pershing II uh, was the 2nd Battalion of the 4th Infantry. And we were to provide ground defense for the Pershing II missiles as they deployed. Okay. All and, right. Well, yeah. we will we will come on to uh, that in a moment. What what were your first impressions sure. of Germany? Presumably, it's the first time you'd, you'd been to Germany? Yes, correct. And I can tell you it was cold. When I got there in uh, February 87, it was one of the coldest <laughs> winters in a long time. And it was just ice everywhere. And all I had was my... Uh, uh, coat, you know, the black trench coat they issued uh, GIs back then as part of their Class A uniform, and it just wasn't enough. But uh, otherwise, yeah, uh, the highway system, obviously the Autobahn looks, you know, very similar. And actually, I guess the, in the United States, they're a copy of the Autobahn system to begin with. So it, it didn't look that unfamiliar. And uh, I was on a bus with a bunch of GIs, and as you know, as we left Frankfurt, we were stopping at various locations and dropping these soldiers off as to the units they're being assigned to. And I was the last stop, and I was dropped off in Neuel, Germany, in Baden-Württemberg. Right. But, yeah, but that, like I said, that my first impression was it was not cold. <laughs> and what were you told about, you know, the East and East Germany and the Soviets? Well, I tell you, you know, it, when I went through boot camp at Fort Benning, Georgia, we had a mass meeting one time or, or, or a lecture, and the guy was supposed to have been a uh, Soviet military liaison, liaison officer. And they brought him in, and the room was just packed with GIs sitting in chairs. And, and what it was, this guy got up there on stage and just harangued the United States, how it's corrupt and imperialistic and as it turns out, it was a uh, U.S. Army military intelligence guy who happened to have like a Soviet jacket, and it was part of the indoctrination program to kind of like whip us up into "Hey, rah rah, America, let's 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 serve and get these guys." Right. But like you, I I grew up in the Cold War era, so it was like naturally it was ingrained in us that they were the adversary. And at that time, that was Reagan's army, so we had like an extra. Uh, injection of rah-rah patriotism. Yeah, yeah the whole evil empire stuff that was around at that point. Yep. And did you actually visit the border? Did they take you there just to show you what it was like? Yes, actually, that is, that's a good point, is part of the in-processing back then, when you're first assigned to your unit, you haven't been assigned to a, a platoon in particular. You go through uh, in-processing process where they teach you about German culture and you know your duties as a soldier in Germany that kind of thing and one part of it was they would take tour buses to uh, the East German border and of course they pull up to the border they let you out and you walk around and you, uh, look at the guard towers and the wall and I think the town it was near was called Herla Germany which means hell in English and I got some nice pictures of it, I might add, too. But it was funny was there was a main guard tower there. And as we Americans all got off the bus, is the uh, East German military personnel, the border guards, were kind of like making fun of us. And I can remember one guy was wearing an East German tracksuit. He wasn't in a, uh, a, you know, in his duty uniform. He was wearing a tracksuit. He was kind of like mocking us and everything. So how, how was he mocking you? What, what was he doing? Uh, I couldn't understand what he was saying, but he was like taunting us from inside the tower and you could hear his comrades in the inside, the actual guards themselves who are wearing uniforms. They were like kind of laughing. Right. And they right. Kind of okay. If if you got photos yeah. of that visit it, um, and you can share them with me, I think that that would be really interesting to see those. <laughs> oh, I've been delighted to. Yeah. No doubt about it. Well, the cool thing was, is you could see there was like a manufacturing, uh, plant right next to the wall and i remember i could see an east german woman standing up inside and she kind of looked at me and i looked at her i didn't wave at her or anything but it was a case like she want, looked like she really wanted to say something but knew for for a very good reason not to 
And off in the distance, there was a, uh, another factory, and it had this uh, huge uh, red banner with some German phrases on it. I'll have to look it up. I haven't looked at it in probably you know, 30 years, for goodness sakes. But, yeah, it was, it was quite a thing to see the Berlin Wall up close. And one of your first impressions I had was just how rickety the wall looked like. It, to me, it looked like you could just walk over to it and push it down. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that, I think, yeah, the section you would have been looking at was like the inner German border where some of it was just fence rather yeah. than uh, concrete. Yeah, this one had, yeah, this one actually had uh, concrete walls. And like I said, it just looked like it, it, they were falling over. And you'll see that in the photographs yeah. when I send yeah. them to you. Okay, okay. So, I mean, you, me- you mentioned that you were uh, placed in a Pershing missile unit, the Pershing two missile. Can you just for for our listeners who aren't familiar with that, can you just um, let them know of its uh, let's say capabilities? Well, the Pershing two was a successor missile to the Pershing one, which the which was a medium range uh, nuclear missile, and it was designed to be kind of a counter of the SS-20, I think, which the Russians had just deployed themselves. Uh, It's about, uh, it's like five feet short of being 40 feet long. And uh, the range of it, I was told, was like 1,100 kilometers, which is like, uh, let me see, I wrote it down, but the miles were, it was 1,770 kilometers and about 1,100 English or Imperial miles to get to Moscow. Right. And they say it could hit, hit Moscow in 15 minutes. And it was about 80 kilo, kilotons in explosive power. Right. But th- this was a nuclear, a tactical nuclear, nuclear missile. missile. Correct, yes. Right. Okay. And, and your role is, as you said, was, was close defense. So, so can you just outline a little bit more detail as to what that involved? Sure. Well, the Pershing missiles, when they weren't in the field, were garrisoned at three locations. One was at, uh, Schwäbisch Gmünd, Germany and Baden Württemberg, which was the headquarters of the Pershing command. There they had a weapon storage site, but it was really more for show, as I came to know, because They never kept nuclear weapons there, but the site near my uh, garrison in Noyon was called Langrube, and they actually kept nuclear weapons there, and Heilbronn, which was the cast site, which was called Camp Redleg, they also kept nuclear weapons there. But they were each associated with a missile firing battery, And I couldn't tell you how many actual launchers they had there at the time, but each one represented three uh, Pershing missile batteries. In the event of war, they all had their separate areas where they would deploy. And anyways, our infantry, when we were in garrison, we were to guard those places. Each company would be of of the 2nd Battalion, 4th Infantry, would get 30 days assigned there as a guard detachment. And it would be twenty four seven guard duty, and a quick, uh, rap, rap, excuse me, rapid reaction force in case someone tried to breach the fence. And more likely than not, it was an anti nuclear demonstrator. Right, which which we'll come on to in a, in a little while. Go on. Sure. Uh, my uh, good fortune was I was assigned to scout platoon, and scout platoon we were like the motorized advanced guard of the Pershing missile, we would go to like external firing points and scout them out places where they thought about deploying the missiles and make sure they're clear. And then once the missiles arrived and their ground defense forces, we would pull out and go somewhere else. We also did uh, uh, traffic control when the missiles were on the road and deploying to uh firing points so we'd make sure the road was clear so and unlike most of my comrades in the infantry line companies we rarely pulled tower duty which was quite a quite a plus because the doing guard duty in a tower is not pleasant for like two or three hours straight and then and i'll get more into more detail of how those poor tower guards had to deal with uh, being stuck at a nuclear weapons site yeah 
Yeah, and and so I mean these are quite sizable vehicles. So um, when they're being deployed, they they must have some sort of off road capability, I presume. Oh yes, yeah. They're the missiles themselves are pulled by a man truck, and I'm trying to think uh, what the name of. So it it's was. a bit like a like the equivalent of an articulated lorry nowadays in terms of its length. Exactly. Right. Yeah. If I had to say what it would look like, kind of like a uh, flat bag, flatbed truck with a, uh, you know, a, a platform that could be raised up on by arms. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and as part of your close defense role, what sort of armaments did you have? Well, I was in Scout Platoon. We had, when I first arrived in Germany, we had the old Jeeps. And each uh, platoon in Scout Platoon, each squad, I should say, had uh, three Jeeps. You know, we had a squad leader's Jeep, then we had two team Jeeps. One team Jeep had a M60 machine gun mounted on it, and the second one had a 50 caliber mounted on it. And around 19, toward the end of 1987, we got the Humvees. As a matter of fact, we were the first uh, Army unit in USER to get the Humvees. And from there, uh, it was the same. We had, you know, two of our Humvees had M60s and then one 50 caliber. Mine was always the one that had the 50 caliber right. on it. And I, and I started out as a 50 caliber gunner and then became a driver. Okay. After. And I'm, I'm presuming that even when you were out on exercise with these, because these are nuclear weapons, that you, you were armed um, with live ammunition? Absolutely not. <laughs> Believe it or not. The only people that had, really, yeah, this is believe it or not, this is honestly got truth. Is when we were out on maneuvers, the only personnel that had live ammunition were the uh, officers of the missile firing batteries. They had forty-five caliber pistols with ammunition. That was it. When we were on maneuvers, no ammunition. Wow. Now we were now we were at the nuclear weapons site, and that's generally speaking where they actually had nuclear weapons. Yes, we had ninety rounds of ammunition for the M16s. Yeah. So, so when you were exercising, were you exercising with dummy missiles, or were they the real thing? They were the real missiles, but the uh, warheads were dummies. Okay. Okay, got it. And I think a, a lot of it was it's political is they did not want a GI to actually shoot an anti-nuclear demonstrator. Could you imagine what would happen if that? Yeah, I can't imagine that being a very good headline yeah. in uh, in any country, let alone uh, West West Germany. Oh yes, um, but but that, that's that's really interesting. No, and how often did you exercise the the deployments? Well, the big one is every year we had an operation called uh, Carbon Blazer. And that was the big maneuver where the entire uh, command would deploy to the field and practice uh, setting up and launching the missiles. And that's where we would get really get our work in for traffic control and scouting out uh, external firing points for the missiles. And when the missiles would deploy to the field, they were in long convoys. And, and we used to call it the circus train because if that's what it looked like. Because we always have the, the escort vehicles in front with their uh, collision lights flashing, and the missile trucks also had flashing lights on the top of them, too. And they would go through these uh, you know, long highways and those long dirt roads, and occasionally they would pass through a small German town. And there was one incident where they had a missile hit the side of someone's house. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So it could be tricky going to the field back then, but like I said, we called it the circus train. We made it happen. Yeah, I've I've heard stories of sort of like you know these convoys being followed by uh, jeeps with officers in with bags load bag loads of cash yep. to uh, compensate any householder for oh, any yeah. damage yeah. to their fence or building. Oh yeah. Yep. Um, did you ever get bothered by uh, Socksmiths? You know the Soviet military liaison units that were in West Germany. 
Uh, actually, I never did, but we did. I know for a fact that one of uh, the guys in our second squad, they ran a smelling vehicle off the road for sure. Right. Well, because it was just getting too close or yep. – uh, and it, I'm, I'm sure that was purely accidental that it ended up off the road. Uh, well, yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> knowing, the, knowing the guys I served with, they probably tried to run them off the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I know, I know. Um, so when when the the missiles are deployed, how long were they intended to stay at the launch site? Was it sort of like fire and then move in, in the uh, real back to base? Yeah, in the real world, is they would fire and then beat feet to another location. Uh, while we were on maneuvers, because you know we always had trouble potential trouble with anti-nuclear demonstrators, we would tend to, to stay in one location and conduct exercises there. And then probably the next day after that, move somewhere else, mainly because it required so much coordination with the German police who were always there with us. Everywhere we went, uh, the German police were there with us. Right, right. And and what measures were taken to defend the sites? Presumably you, you set up some sort of defensive perimeter and foxholes and this sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. It was one of the first things they do when they deploy the missiles on maneuvers is they put up camouflage netting. And after that, everybody puts up a defensive position because, you know, we have like what they call stand to in the army where first thing in the morning, everybody's up. And one and everybody gets into their fighting position. It was true with us and scouts, even though we weren't anywhere near the missiles themselves, we had to get up when we first deployed, we had to have to set up a perimeter somewhere. And it was certainly true for the firing batteries. And I think realistically at that time their main threat was anti nuclear people getting through and causing damage to the missile launchers. Yeah. Yeah. And what what were you or who were you told to expect as a threat aside from anti-nuclear demonstrators? Presumably there was a fear of Spetsnaz or, or something like that. Oh, yes. That was very much uh, the enemy we were always trained for. And the funny thing is, is our officers and NCO would always tell us that Spetsnaz were so good that we would we were expected to be just as a kind of delaying tactic because they were going to kill us all and they would get on through us and you know hopefully the missiles had launched back then. And what was cool is oh gosh, uh, a f- after I'd been there like maybe a year, or two years, a couple of my comrades and I we were told to report to a, a theater. And we thought we were going to get a lecture on like, you know, driving during the winter or something crazy like that. But what it was is the army was taking around this defector from Polish version of Spetsnaz. And he was lecturing us on his experiences and being in the the Polish uh, special forces. And one of the topics was, is, you know, how they would approach a, a nuclear missile. And it was funny, was this guy just didn't look like your typical Spetsnaz or what I thought one. I thought they would be like shaved heads and that kind of thing. But no, he had long curly hair, but looked pretty athletic. And I remember the one question I asked him was, do you think you can get get to the Pershing missiles? And his question, his response was, well, if all you need is an ID card to get onto a military base. Yeah, I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> he said that he said that through an interpreter because he didn't speak right, any English. Right. Um, but yeah, that was our that was our arch enemy. You know, the, the one we trained for and expected to have to tangle with was the Spetsnaz. And, and what insights did that guy give you about how how they would um, attempt to attack a, a Pershing missile deployment? Did they give you any? Did he give you any? Uh, insight that you didn't already know or not? No, not really. I mean, it was, it was, it was pretty much what we expected is they would, uh, uh, let me see if I can recall exactly how he put it, but they would track us for a long time and then they would wait for us to let our, essentially to let our guard down. And that's when they would strike. And when you're uh, a young GI 
in Germany where you have on your mind that, you know, when, where's my girlfriend at? When is, when am I going to get my next beer? They wouldn't have to wait long, <laughs> I'm sure, you know, it catches with their pants yeah, down. Yeah. And, and what about, um, the Red Army faction and the the German the West German terrorist threat were you uh, was that part of your training or yes actually what would happen was is in Pirmasens Germany there was a site security school and we would have to rotate through that school uh, once a year at least and one of the things they had was a slideshow on terrorist attacks in Germany. And how uh, guards would be killed while sleeping on duty. And they had this one slideshow, and it was very gruesome. Uh, back, and I think it was might have been in the 70s or maybe the late 60s, a uh, German parachute unit was guarding a uh, weapon storage site for the Bundeswehr. Well, these criminals, criminals broke in and assaulted the guard shack. And their idea was to steal the weapons and the ammunition in there and then extort money from the German government. And uh, anyways, they killed everybody in the guard shack. The first thing they did was they, and they actually had this on a slideshow, is the poor corporal of the guard, he was sitting at his de- desk and he had been shot and had a knife stat, knife wound in the face. And the rest of the guards were all in their sleeping bags on their bunks dead they'd all been shot in the head and that was kind of a warning to us hey you know if if you're not uh careful this could be you wow and i could i wish i could tell you more details about that incident but yeah it was the pictures were quite gruesome yeah yeah no certainly it sounds like that that got your attention anyway um and but essentially this the, the school itself at Permisens was uh, essentially you, it was a weapon storage site, and you had an aggressor team, which was usually us and scouts, and then you had the uh, the tower guards and the uh, emergency response forces. There was two of them. One was called SAT, Situation Alert Team, and then there was BAF, which was the the backup alert alert force, which would support the uh, SAT team as they deployed for like a, you know, a penetration or something right. like that. And, and you mentioned earlier the anti-nuclear demonstrators. I mean, what, what, what was, was it pretty much the, the same sort of training that if they breached certain fences and certain areas, then they would to be treated as a, with, well, that's to be. Yeah. Well, actually with, in the case of, they were be treated as pretty much like the same way we would deal with Spetsnaz is there was like two fences. And if they pen- tried to, to cross the, ex- the exterior fences, we would give them a warning. Hey, this is, you know, U S military. We don't try and enter. And if they crawl, tr- attempted to climb uh, the second perimeter fences, then we would exit the guard tower and lock and load. And if they made it to the other side and have not physically touched the ground, we would fire a warning shot. And if they ran toward the uh, nuclear storage bunkers, you know, the weapon storage bunkers, we would shoot. We were directed to shoot them in the leg. And fortunately, that never happened any time while I was there, and nor did it happen any time before I got there that that ever happened. Generally speaking, when I first got there, I had hard feelings against, you know, the the anti-nuclear people. But when I started to become aware of where they're coming from, uh, they were a nuisance, but I didn't hate them or anything like that. And to their credit, they were always nonviolent. But, man, they could be a nuisance. Yeah. No, I, I, I can imagine. So you, you, you were going to mention about the the guard duty in the towers at these weapons facilities. Yeah, yeah. Usually there are like uh, four hour shifts, and when we pulled guard duty in these towers, you we weren't allowed to sit down. You could only have a canteen of water, and you had ninety rounds of ammunition. You always had to wear your helmet and your uh, 
body, you know, your flak vest and your full LBE, which is our load bearing equipment. So it wasn't fun to do for four hours straight, especially in a hot guard tower when the sun was beating down on it. Yeah. And why the limitation on the water? I guess so you didn't have to disappear off to. <laughs> exactly. You had, you know, one canteen and if you needed more water, someone would bring right. it to you. Otherwise, you had to stay right there. And there's no bathroom breaks while you're in a tower. Yeah, yeah. Just going back to the the missile deployment, I think we we may have covered this, but once the missiles had been fired, could you reload the launcher or was it just a one-shot weapon? Yeah, that I couldn't tell you. Uh, In my opinion, it was probably a one-shot weapon, but I don't know that for sure because I don't know how many times you get a chance to reload and fire. Yeah. But they, cert- they certainly had the capabilities to do it because uh, they were always followed by supply trucks and supply vehicles that could easily resupply them. So I would say probably so, but we only had uh, a limited number of missiles. I think they only built like maybe a little over 200 of Pershings of all type. And then you bear in mind they were constantly retiring older ones or ones that were defective. Yeah. yeah. So, so my, my, my belief, and I don't know this is a fact, is probably not. I don't think you would get a second chance to fire them. No. And I guess, you know, what once they're fired, you know that the Soviets aren't just going to sit back and right. let that happen or, or let that not be uh, reacted to. Yep. But that's just speculation on my part. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. No, sure. no, no, that's yeah. fair. That's, that's fair enough. I mean, you know, obviously knowing the capabilities of these of these weapons, did you ever think about, you know, that where they were going to land and, you know, civilian casualties and that sort of thing? Did that ever come into you? Yeah, mind? actually, yeah, actually I did. And I think that was probably true for most of us GIs is we were very aware of what a lethal weapon that was. You know, we had all grew up in the shadow of World War II and, and of course all those Cold War films and of course Hollywood put out its share of, uh, uh, movies where there was a nuclear attack and that kind of thing. So yeah, it was very much on our mind. And, but you know, it was in that era, we had a choice of get them or they get us. And it was just the way it was, but yeah, we didn't like the weapon, but we, it was a necessary evil. Yeah. Yeah. No, understood. Understood. No, I appreciate you um, sh- sharing that with me. So you, you were still with the Pershing when the, um, the INF, the intermediate, um, nuclear oh, yeah. uh, weapons treaty yes. was was signed. How how did that change things? Well, the the first thing that happened was a, a bit of uncertainty in our minds what would happen to us uh, once they actually uh, got rid of the missiles because you know we were an infantry unit would we be deactivated or sent somewhere else? But as far as the treaty itself goes, yeah, I was definitely there when the Russian inspectors were coming through. And I've, I've got a funny anecdote about that. Is I was at Heilbronn at Camp Redleg, and it was one of the few times I pulled tower duty. But anyways, hey, they said, hey, the, the Russian inspectors are coming through, so we had to clean up the place, GI, and that kind of thing. And... Part of the treaty was they can inspect anywhere they wanted to on the site itself, the missile site itself, but they weren't allowed to come and physically come inside our sleeping quarters. But we had to leave the doors open. So one time uh, the inspectors came through and there was like, you know, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 of them. They're probably accompanied by, you know, American escorts and, you know, God knows who else. But it was funny as they were walking in our corridor, like right behind each other, so close that when the first guy stopped, the guys all behind them all <laughs> ran into each other. And gosh, that was funny, you know. But the funny thing about the inspectors, the Russian inspectors, is they weren't anything like I imagined. I imagined these guys in like a, kind of like jumpsuit or coveralls with some kind of hat on that said, hey, inspector mm. or something like that. But no, they were kind of like nerdy scientist types and they're wearing like, you know, plaid shirts and some of them had long curly hair and beards and mustaches. I would have, you know, mistaken them for an American electrician or something like that or maybe a 
some kind of like hip professor at the university didn't look anything right. like I imagine. Right. So they were more like almost like technical personnel rather than military personnel. Exactly. Yes. No question about it. I didn't see anybody that I would say, hey, this guy is in the yeah, Soviet yeah. military. Certainly didn't look muscly enough to be Spetsnaz then. <laughs> oh, no, 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 not at all. Um, <laughs> not at all. Like I said, the best description I could come up with is they look like maybe a teacher at like a technical right. college or something like that. So they had corduroy jackets on then. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's a, that's right. pretty much what they look like, you know. That's pretty much what they look at. They didn't look anything like I would imagine. In that must have been so. bizarre, though, like because you know that you were still effectively enemies, but they were allowed yep. to inspect mm -hmm. one of your most, you know, powerful and secret at the time weapons, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it was it, it was an extremely bizarre situation for all of us, especially those of us that had been so yeah. indoctrinated about it. the Soviet yeah. bad guy. You know, to actually see these guys up close, and I'll be honest with you, seeing them as I described, it was a bit underwhelming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, did that did that make you feel at the time that hmm, I wonder whether things are going to get better between us and the and the Soviets? Yeah. Well, I tell you, the big change was Gorbachev coming to power. That seemed like a, a, a like a, the beginning of a whole new world because he seemed like you know, he's, he wasn't your typical you know sour faced, wrinkly old Soviet premier that we like a Brezhnev or Chernenko. No, he was a young guy. He was very energetic, and I can tell you from dealing with the Germans back then, as they were extremely optimistic. Uh, Gorbachev was a heck of a lot more popular than Reagan was at that time. They thought, I think there were some polls taken back then, and most of the Germans thought Reagan would be more likely to start a nuclear war than Gorbachev. But I remember when Gorbachev came to power, is the first thing I did is go over to the Stars and Stripes bookstore, and I bought a small biography of Gorbachev and started reading it to find out what this guy was all about. But having said that, yeah, it was it was an optimistic period because, you know, we'd had, at least since Reagan came to office, fear of a new nuclear war and that kind of thing. And, and uh, the tensions were at their worst. And then suddenly you have Gorbachev and it was just like the curtain lifted off the Soviet Union. Yeah. So it seemed like the dawn of a new age. Yeah. It's it's an interesting period because um, I don't know whether how familiar you are with the Able Archer exercise and oh yeah well, i saw a documentary on it I'll put right it that way. uh i've got i've got an episode on it but you you might not have caught up on that and you're, you're excused for not having listened to all of them um, <laughs> okay. um but you know obviously that closeness to the soviets actually thinking that the u.s or nato was going to attack them as a first strike um mm -hmm. i think reagan's realization after that is that his bellicose rhetoric about evil empire and stuff like that was you know really freaking them out um yep and i also read that after he saw the movie the day after um mm -hmm. that really affected him as well and he seemed to be almost a completely different per you know when particularly once gorbachev came in you know, he obviously felt that this was somebody who he could do business with and maybe do a, you know, a wide ranging deal on on nuclear weapons. And the INF Treaty was, I guess, the start of that. Yeah, well, it's, well, fortunately, he was surrounded by some really good people like James Baker, for one. And of course, in Britain, that that back time, I, even though I, I hear that she's rather unpopular, was Margaret Thatcher. I mean, it, in the West back then, we had some really good statesmen and stateswomen that kept, you know, the worst of the confrontation between East and West from ever happening. And, and I guess, you know, as a civilization, we were lucky at that time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's probably a, a conversation for another episode, but you could argue, sure, argue that, yeah. you know, the whole nuclear deterrence worked in so much that there was fear on both sides and that, you know, that that stopped the Cold right. War becoming a hot well, war. 
Yeah, well, I can tell you, you know, in my experience, the time that I was afraid, and it's probably a strange thing to say, was when the Berlin Wall came down and it looked like the end of the, the, the confrontation between East and West and that uncertainty of what the future world would mean. It was, it was, it caused a little bit of an anxiety in, in me and myself. I don't know what it was like for anybody else, but just the, the fear of the unknown and not knowing what the, the new world that was coming uh, would bring uh, yeah it, it definitely yeah. caused a little bit of anxiety yeah. anxiety yeah yeah no i think you're right i mean you know i think i'm i'm trying to say you know not a fondness for the period of the cold war but during that period there was much more certainty as to who your enemy yeah. was um yeah and now now i'm looking at an enemy i have no idea is out there or if there is one or what it would mean it was a whole new world and where i fit into that world or the united states fit in that world was was a bit disconcerting because no one knew yeah yeah and where were you when you heard about the uh, the fall of the wall well i was actually uh in uh, neuilly germany back at the barracks and then the news broke and we all rushed to a tv set such as they were back then because it was some of us couldn't get German television, but it was covered enough on the American news that we could get. And Cause you know, back then we didn't have the 24 hour news. So we had to like get the breaking news as it came in and it was exciting. It was just unbelievably exciting at that time to see that wall finally come down. Yeah. Yeah. And so were, were you sort of, I'm, I'm just interested to know, were you lying on your bunk and somebody came in and said, you'll never guess what's happened or. Yeah, that, that was pretty much the way it happened. You know, is no one expected it to happen. And then somebody, cause you know, we had a CQ back then, or I guess they still do have them where the guy just watched the assigned two guys to watch the desk overnight and listen for the phone. And the uh, CQ came around, was telling everybody that was in the barracks, hey, did you hear the walls coming down? And then it's when we all rushed to a TV set. Yeah. And sure enough, there it was. Wow. The world changed overnight. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what What did you most like about your, your job, would you say? Uh, realistically, I considered myself lucky. And that was attached to scout platoon because I was rarely stuck at a fixed site when we moved, went out on maneuvers. And also when we were uh, deployed to a uh, missile storage site, we was, we were always free to drive around. So I got to see a lot of Germany. And of course I had some really good comrades that I served with. And many of them I'm still in touch with today. I think I told you one who's an author. And it, like, it was just exciting and to be able to drive around Baden-Württemberg, which is, you know, when the sun is out, the occasionally when the sun is out, it's an absolutely beautiful region in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. No, ab absolutely. Absolutely. And what did you least like yeah. about the job? Uh, probably the army itself. You know, it's when you're assigned to a, a high visibility unit like the Pershing missiles is, it's very political. You always have someone watching you, and they always want you to, to have this cleaned and spit and polished. So in that sense, it was a pain in the neck. But otherwise, I, I my tour in Germany was exciting. I, lo I loved it. I loved every minute of it. And one of the things I got to do, and I will go back to the positive thing, is we got to be aggressors for the NATO LERP school at Weingarten, Germany, where we would uh, essentially chase uh, – long range and evasion and reconnaissance patrol units from all the NATO units. And I can tell you, you know, uh, the best units to chase were the British units, especially the Royal Marine commandos. Oh, they were fun. They were just absolutely fun to chase. And the other units, you know, they weren't quite as motivated, especially the American units. They just would go to the NATO alert school and say, Hey, let's go through this and get it over with. But the British units always were a challenge. They were a lot of fun. They were really a game opponent. <laughs> That's good to hear. Yeah. That's good to hear. We value for money. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, you know, if, if I had to analyze, psychoanalyze it, I think in the British character is they don't like being second to none under any circumstances. 
So when they're deployed in a situation like that, as an aggressor, you know, being chased or their, their opponent in an exercise, they give it their 100% because they don't want to look second to none to yeah. anybody. Or Certainly, to the, yeah, I, th- I think that would especially be the case of, yeah. of a unit like the Royal Marine Commandos, to be honest. Oh, yeah, I tell you what, we would get whoever caught a Royal Marine Commando unit would get a rack of beer from the platoon leader <laughs> if we did. But uh, I'll be honest with you, we never did until the last day of the course because it was a week long course. And by then, that's when we catch the British is when they were tired. Right. We would first catch the uh, SAS reservists, and that's because they're all in their like mid to late thirties. But the Royal Marine Commandos, the Paras, or the SAS, the young guys, we wouldn't catch until if we ever caught them, we wouldn't be till the end of the course. Right, and more and, often than not, we didn't catch them. Right, and so and th- what were they? Were they intended to simulate a Spetsnaz attack or something like that? Is that what, well, what they were? Is, they were doing? What, yeah, what it is is the training course is about. Uh, being able to track an enemy unit unobserved, in other words, like a Russian tank unit, and the LERPs would try and like follow a mock unit or go to a mock location where, like, say there was a, a tank set up, and they would try and get as close as they could and get as much information they could and sneak out and not get caught. Well, we were, you know, the scout platoon, we were the quote-unquote aggressor or the Russians, and our job was to hunt for them. And so it was uh, It was a grueling course for those poor guys. For one, they had to make their own sleeping bags, and they were given, like, burlap, plastic, and that kind of thing, and a limited amount of rash, rations. And they were given, like, one week, and they had to go to these certain points and, like, say, you know, write down the Russian writing on, like, a, a fence or something like that and then sneak out of there without getting caught. And meanwhile, you've got an American unit that's got the use of helicopters, and drag in thermal sites to track them at night and I get caught. So it's quite, it's quite impressive. You can go the entire week without getting caught. And yeah. well, I'll tell you what, that was a Royal Marine commandos. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, no, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. is, is there any other stories you think uh, that are, that are worth sharing about your time um, with the well, US actually, Army? We, yeah, actually, there's later on. Uh, I went to uh, was stop loss. I was about to get out of the army, and I was sent to the Second Cavalry Regiment to the Persian Gulf War. But that to me wasn't as interesting, you know, in a funny way, than it was my time with the Persian. When I went with the Second Cavalry during the Persian Gulf War, I was just a cog in a wheel. You know, I wouldn't have noticed. Nobody would have noticed me. But so I preferred my time in Germany. Yeah. And yeah. and after the war came down, did you ever meet any of the uh, the opposition aside from the uh, INF inspectors? No, not at all. Uh, we did see a lot of uh, East Germans and their turbines on the on the highway. And one incident sticks out in my mind is we were driving uh, to Heilbronn from New Ulm and we had to stop at a German rest stop to use the to relieve ourselves. And it was funny was there was an East German family and their little Trabants and we pulled up right next to them and they would not get out of that Trabant until we had left because they were so terrified of us. <laughs> I guess that, you know, they were, you know, they were still affected by the, uh, you know, the East German propaganda that we were like rapists and monsters and that kind of thing. But it was kind of funny is they would not get out. At that Trabant until we had yeah, left. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because I, I yesterday I watched a video of um, Bruce yeah. Springsteen concert in East Berlin yeah. in 1988, yeah. and there's 130,000 East Germans at, at this concert, wow. yeah. and you know they're all singing along to the songs and waving the stars and stripes. Yeah. Um, well, I wonder. I wonder what would happen if they had dropped like an American or a British soldier amongst them. Would they like? parted like parting the red sea or something like that well it's interesting because i i have interviewed a couple of the people from the um the british military liaison units that um were traveling around east germany and and you know they they say that you know they would get a lot of not a lot of but they would get help from quite a few people you know if they got stuck bogged down in a field a tractor would often pull them out or or something like that you know 
Oh, that, was, that definitely happened to us. The Pershings, you know, uh, we would get our, when we were first taking our Humvees out in the snow, they're very heavy for uh, the German clay. So they would sink right up to the axle. And we would have German farmers pull us out all the time. And yeah, we had great relations with the German public. Even the anti-nuclear demonstrators weren't that bad once you got to talk to some of them, you know. But uh, uh, that that one encounter with the East Germans, I just it sticks out in my mind just because of how funny it was. It was the only, I, I won't say negative, but the unusual encounter I had with the East yeah. Germans once the wall came down. Otherwise, I'd run into them in like bars and stuff like that, and they were okay to well that's all we had time for but if you'd like to learn more then head over to our show notes which are at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 77 this will also show us a link in some podcast apps the show notes have some videos relating to this episode which are well worth a look don't forget, if you'd like a Cold War Conversations coaster and help us keep us on the air, then head over to patreon.com slash coldwarpod or again, click on the link in your podcast app. You can also help us by leaving reviews on iTunes, Stitcher, our Facebook page or with your favourite podcast provider. This really helps to raise our profile and get new guests on the show. And if you can't wait for our next episode, do visit our Facebook discussion group where our guests and listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. <laughs>